All right, and the last thing I want to talk about today are inverse functions. So, in particular, uh, the, the main point of this is to get to the inverse trigonometric functions because those are very important for us. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let's talk about inverse functions in the general sense. Um, and uh, this is old pre calculus stuff. Uh, two functions are inverses if they satisfy this condition. If that uh, f and g compose to the same result, just plain x in both directions. So f composed with g, g composed with f. If I simplify, the result is x. So um, <clears throat> anytime functions satisfy this condition, then we can use the inverse notation. Inverse functions come in pairs. One function and its inverse are related through the composition rule. And here's the important property that we're, there's lots of properties of inverse functions that uh, um, are consequences of this definition. But for our purposes, and what we're going to be doing here is uh, this. If two functions are related through the inverse process, then any evaluation from one immediately translates into an evaluation for the other. If f of a is equal to b, then f inverse of b is equal to a. So you can always move back and forth between those two evaluations. Now, not all functions have inverses. It's a very special relationship. A function has to be uh, set up in just the right way for it to actually have an inverse. Uh, if it does, we're going to call it invertible. And the main condition for invertible functions is the property of being what's called one-to-one. -one. Um, but we're not going to make a big deal about that. We're not going to worry about one-to-oneness or, or any of that for now. Uh, but just do be aware that when we say a function is invertible, or, or the, if a function has an inverse, then it has to be a one-to-one -one function, uh, otherwise it won't have that. But we're not going to uh, uh, dwell on that. What's important is this. Uh, as we already know, or I hope you already know, uh, every piece of information about a function is contained in its inverse and vice versa. So there's nothing new. Structurally, the two functions are identical. They just present information in a different way. Um, <coughs> and so why shouldn't that be true? of derivatives. <coughs> so it turns out that if I know all the properties, so I've, if I have an invertible function, so I'm assuming f is invertible and it is differentiable, so if I have an invertible and differentiable function, then the derivative of the inverse can be computed through the derivative of the original function. And so here's the formula that relates the derivative of the inverse, so I'm trying to take the derivative of f inverse and I can find it as long as I can find the derivative of the original function. So uh, again, uh, I don't know. Uh, I could prove this, but I, I'm not going to. We're just going to go ahead and, and take this formula as given. But there it is. There's the important link between the derivative of the inverse through the derivative of its partner function. Uh, so, so let's go ahead and apply that. You know, here's an example of the sort of information that we need to be able to accomplish this. Uh, I'm given a function. I know it's invertible. Uh, the function uh, evaluates 0 to negative 1, and its derivative evaluates to 0 at 5. So for this information, can you now tell me what is the derivative of the inverse going to be equal to if I evaluate it at negative 1? So uh, things have to be set up just right uh, for us to do this in the abstract case. But let's go ahead and see. Uh, so according to the rule, what does this mean? Well, uh, I've got to be able to find the derivative of the inverse at negative 1 is going to be equal to this. 1 over the inverse of, uh, sorry, the derivative of the original function composed with f inverse at the same point. So there's the substitutions required for the formula. I need to know the, uh, I'm trying to find this. The first thing I need to know, what is the value of the inverse at negative one? That's the first piece of information I need. So, what is it? Zero. Why? Because we were told that f of zero is equal to negative one. So that's why I needed this piece of information, because I needed to have a corresponding valuation for the inverse. That's the first thing I get. 
and now I have to actually know something about the derivative of the original function. But again, just so happened, I was given that. They told me what f prime of zero is equal to. So there. So that's how this fun this formula is, this theorem is applied. I've got to be able to find, so for the uh, indicated point where I'm trying to find the value of the derivative for the original function, I've got to be able to evaluate the inverse at that point, and I need to be able to evaluate the derivative of the original function. But I don't need the derivative of the inverse function. Please notice that in this whole process, I really didn't need to know what that derivative was. All I had to be able to do is find the particular evaluation and then the only derivative I needed was the partner function, not the inverse, but the original. So uh, that's the way it's got to work. I've got to be able to find an evaluation at the given point for the original function and I've got to be able to evaluate the derivative of the original function at, the, uh, at that result. Okay, so here's an abstract way and again, here's the important step. The important step in all of this is getting here because the only value because I'm going to be able to, I'm, if I'm given the original function the derivative is something I'm going to be able to derive uh, but that evaluation figuring out what's the inverse function equal to at the given point that's going to have to come from this uh, property from this evaluation property of inverse functions um, so let's see if we can do that for a particular function Uh, here's a function. This, this function is invertible, it turns out. Uh, but the actual inverse function is very hard to, to come up with. If I actually need to solve this for the inverse, uh, it's almost, well, it's not, it's not impossible, but it's virtually impossible. So this function does have an inverse. The question is, what would the value of the inverse be at the point where x is equal to 1? So let's see. If, uh, so uh, if I go back and look at my formula, the only really derivative evaluation that I need is the derivative of the original function f. So let's go ahead and get that. What's the derivative of f in this case? Okay. And so what the formula tells me that is that f, the derivative of in, f inverse evaluated at 1 is going to be equal to the reciprocal of the derivative of the original function evaluated at the point where f inverse itself is equal to 1. So the tricky part comes here. What is f inverse of 1 equal to? And I'm going to go ahead, right now I don't know, I'm going to go ahead and give it a name. I don't know what, I guess I'll call it, I don't know, I'll call it Q for now. Can you tell me, based on the original function, what does Q have to be? Q is whatever number the original function F evaluates to 1. Now, that's a whole different problem now. What we're really trying to do now is solve this equation. We're trying to solve the equation x cubed plus x plus 3. Well, actually q here. I'm using q. So I'm trying to figure out for what number will q to the third power plus q plus 3, when will that be equal to 1? Uh, now, in general, this is a hard equation to solve. Uh, it's very difficult. But can you tell me, just by looking at it, can you inspect that, this equation here and tell me, what does Q have to be? Negative 1. Right? This is simple enough, and the solution is small enough, that by inspection I can see Q equals negative 1 will solve this equation. Now, uh, I, this is a typical problem with these inverse functions because if the function was simple enough that the inverse could be derived directly or explicitly, then we wouldn't need this formula. 
the problem comes because this function does have an inverse, but I have no idea what it's actually equal to in explicit form. Okay, but now I know. Uh, just, by, just because this was simple enough, I could look at that, I could see, now I know what that's equal to. Uh, F inverse of 1 must be negative 1 because F of negative 1 is equal to 1. So negative 1 goes here. And now what is F inverse, or the derivative of F, evaluated at negative 1. Well, that's the easy part. Let's take a look at 4. So I have no idea what the derivative of F looks like, but I do know what it's equal to when I evaluate it at 1 because of the properties of the partner function, the original function that this is the inverse of. So again, very similar to what we saw in the previous case, uh, it's right here. This is where all the work, or if it gets tricky, this is where it's going to be. Being able to determine the value of the inverse function for the given function. And if that were a simple problem, then we wouldn't need this formula, or this theorem. But because that's a difficult thing in itself, we were lucky enough in this case that uh, these numbers were chosen in such a way that it's not hard to see how that was going to work itself out. Uh, but if I had to solve that algebraically, uh, yeah, it would take me all day. I'd still be working on it. So, Okay, so this formula is important because this is the link between uh, the derivative of a function and the derivative of its inverse. And this theorem tells me that if I want to know any property of the derivative of the inverse, that can all be determined through the derivative of the original function. So in exactly the same way that algebraically uh, a form, a inverse function's information is all contained in its partner, that goes for the calculus part of this also. Uh, but what's really important here is this, right? Based on, uh, we've got three outstanding functions that we do need to address. Uh, the inverse trigonometric functions that we talked about back in pre-calculus 2. Um, now I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about these functions and their properties. Here's a summary of those properties. Uh, here's the graphs of the three, fun of the three inverse functions. Uh, cosine inverse, sine inverse, tangent inverse. And there's also inverses for the other three, but we're not, uh, I'm not going to spend any time on those. Uh, the important part about all of this are these statements here. Number one, how is cosine function is inverse related? Very, in the same way that all inverse functions are related. If I know that co y is equal to cosine inverse of x, that's because cosine of y is x. And the same for the sine inverse. If y is equal to sine inverse of x, then that's because sine of y is equal to x. And the same for tangent. So we will be using that, but that's a property that all inverse pairs have. They all had that transposition of coordinates through their evaluations. Um, and here's some alternate notations. This arc notation is quite frequently used for the inverse functions. Uh, I don't think we see that in our homework, but in other book textbooks and uh, in some applications, they'll use arc notation instead of the inverse notation. But they mean the same thing. They're all referred to the same functions. Okay, so uh, there's the summary of the information about these functions and how they behave. Uh, but what I'm really interested in is how, uh, what's, the, uh, what's the derivatives of these functions. How do I find the derivative of starting with um, this inverse sine function? What's the derivative of the inverse sine function? Okay, before I can do that though, I'm going to have to do this. How do I simplify cosine of sine inverse of x? So let's start there. Let's do a little bit of right triangle trigonometry. So here's a little bit of review of what I hope you've seen before. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, I'm going to use the standard notation. Sine inverse of x represents an angle, right? Sine inverse, of, sine inverse of x is the angle for which sine of theta is equal to x. So here's that transposition, right? Theta equals sine inverse of x. So I transpose the coordinates and I can get a statement about the original sine function. So the dependent variable becomes independent, and vice versa. Okay, so a sine of, so what this says is, so this, uh, so what I'm really trying to find out here is uh, what is uh, cosine of theta equal to, let me do it this way, 
you say it this way, uh, what is cosine of theta if sine of theta is equal to x? Well, what is it? Is that equal to? One? If sine of theta is equal to x, then uh, what do I get here? And now I can solve this equation for uh, cosine theta. Like so. So what does cosine of theta equal? Pi the root. Uh, now, this equation does have two solutions, um, but it turns out that it really doesn't matter which one we pick for what we're about to do. So I'm going to go ahead and just focus on the positive solution. Right, we're just going to use the positive solution here and uh, as we go to the next part. But there, there is the result. If I, wanted, if I need to know for any value of x, if I compose cosine with sine inverse of x, I always get 1 minus, the square root of 1 minus x squared. And with the sine, the sine adjusted for quadrant. But we're going to just take the positive for this. Okay, so how does this help us find the derivative of the sine inverse function? Well, like so. According to the formula, the derivative of sine inverse of x. Oh, but first of all, before I do that, Um, if I do this, if I make the original function uh, sine of x, what's the derivative of sine x? Cosine x. Okay, okay so what does the formula tell me? Uh, the formula tells me that if I want to take the derivative of sine inverse of x, how do I do it? Well, I get 1 over f prime evaluated as sine inverse. And that's exactly what the formula says. Now where is it? There it is, right? This f, in, uh, the inverse at x, the inverse at x through the derivative. <coughs> but f inverse, uh, f prime, is cosine x. So this is cosine composed with this inverse sine function. And that's the problem we just solved. We just solved this value. What is cosine of sine inverse? Well, it's equal to the square root of 1 minus x squared. It's a very important result. I started with a transcendental function, right? A trigonometric function. But the derivative of this function is not a trig function at all. It's a rational form. It's an algebraic function. We saw the same thing for the logarithm. The derivative of a logarithm is not a transcendental function. It's itself an algebraic function. And the logarithm is an inverse function. It's the inverse of the exponential. And so here's a common theme. But this is a very important result because we don't have an algebraic representation for this derivative. There's no algebraic function whose derivative is equal to this thing. But now, I can get to it through the inverse sine function. Okay, so that's a very important result as far as um, the um, uh, that result. Uh, but again, I, I, use this, I, I use the fact that I can evaluate cosine of sine inverse. I use the fact that that can be simplified to an algebraic expression. And I use this theorem about how the derivative of the inverse interacts with the derivative of its principal function. Okay, so there's an important result. We're going to have to put this into our... In fact, I'll have to put that on the formula sheet now. I'm not going to make you memorize this. Uh, you should, though, but uh, I sort of need to know how to use it when you see it. <laughs> Let's do the same thing for tangent inverse. Uh, but before, again, uh, before we can do that, I will have to do this evaluation. What is 
secant squared of tangent inverse of x. So once again, tangent inverse of x is an angle. It's the angle that satisfies the condition that tangent of theta is equal to x. So if tangent of theta is equal to x, what is secant equal to? Um, gee, uh, let, let me get let me go back here real quick. Let's look at our set of trig identities. There it is. There's the identity that relates tangent and secant. It's just a variation of the Pythagorean identity that we just referred to for sine and cosine. So I can actually use this now uh, from the fact. Uh, that 1 plus tangent squared uh, is equal to secant squared of theta. Well, now I'm pretty much done. Tangent is equal to x. So when I replace that, there it is. The composition of the tangent, func tangent inverse with secant squared once again reduces to an algebraic expression. It's 1 plus x squared directly through the formula. And now it's not hard to see how very similar result we're going to get here. So if I let my original function f of x be the tangent function with the derivative of the tangent function. squared. And now I can apply the formula. The derivative of tangent inverse is going to be equal to the reciprocal of the derivative of the original function evaluated at the inverse. But we've already done that. The derivative function is secant squared composed with the inverse function but we just solved that problem. That's equal to 1 over 1 plus x squared. There. Again, the derivative of the transcendental function, the inverse, is itself not transcendental. It's an algebraic function. Not only that, it's a rational function. It's polynomial forms. Darn it. Okay, so here's a summary of all that. Here they are. And there's also one for cosine. And cosine also has a similar representation. Uh, but here's the generalized forms for the inverse trigonometric functions and their derivatives. So the derivative of sine inverse, we just did that. Turns out the derivative of cosine is the same. The derivative of the inverse cosine function is the same as the derivative of the inverse sine function, but it's got the extra, it's got negative sign. It's the opposite, it's negative. And there's the tangent functions, derivative. And again, these are generalized forms, so u, not necessarily x, but some function of x. Okay, so these are important, and there they are. We've established, now we haven't proven the inverse cosine, but it's very similar to the example that we used to just solve for a sine function. Okay, so with that being given, what's the derivative of this function? What's the derivative of the inverse sine of x squared? Uh, so the first question is, what rule do I need for this function? Chain rule problem. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and break this down in the traditional sense. Uh, the inside function of composition is, uh, I'm going to call, so this is going to be um, u of v, I'm going to use u and v now. Uh, what's the outside function of composition going to be in this case? What's the inside function of composition going to be? Okay. And what are the derivatives of these two functions? 
Well, the derivative of u uh, we just derived. It's I need some more space here. Uh, it's the uh, from the formula and the derivative of V is 2x. So according to the chain rule, F prime is the derivative of U evaluated at V multiplied by the derivative of V. U prime is all of this stuff and the evaluated at V this guy here goes in place of the original square term. So this piece of it is going to look like this. 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared squared. So there's the function v being put in place of the original variable within the derivative. And then, uh, so that's that part, and then the derivative of the prime the extra factor, that's this part. And so putting this all together and simplifying 2x on top and 1 minus x to the fourth on the bottom. Okay? So there's a derivative of the composite function uh, when uh, there's the interaction between the um, inverse of the trig function. Uh, what about this one? What's tangent inverse of e raised to the power of cosine x? Once again, chain rule problem. The outer function is the inverse tangent whose derivative we just determined. The inside function e raised to the power of cosine x. What's the derivative of that function? derivative of e to the cosine x. So there's another chain rule. There's a double application of the chain rule. e to the cosine x, we always get the derivative of the exponential form back, but we also get the extra factor from chain rule. So e to the cosine x times minus sine x and I would move the negative sign out front. I would never leave it like that. So this involved two applications of the chain rule. And now I'm ready to take the derivative. The derivative here comes about as follows. Uh, again, by definition, this is what I'm going to be doing. So the derivative of f of u evaluated with the inside function, so e to the cosine x is going to take the place of that square term. So 1 over 1 plus, and then that's going to be multiplied by the product minus e to the cosine x times sine x. <coughs> in the end, there's not much we can do here except, uh, number one, uh, I can go ahead and rewrite the fraction. Minus e to the cosine x. Sine x goes on top. And down the bottom, I can simplify the square power, so that's the product rule. So the cosine, the power of cosine x multiplied by the power of 2 in simplest form, that would be 2 cosine x. <coughs> so, there it is. Um, there's the uh, derivative of this expression through the chain rule using the inverse tangent function as a piece of this. <coughs>
Yeah, let's do one more. What rule do I need for part C? It's a product rule problem now. So I'm going to look at my two product factors, or factor functions. Uh, f of x is the square function. g of x is the inverse function. And both of these have, uh, well, they're not simple derivatives. Well, the second one doesn't have a simple derivative, but we know what it is because we just derived it. Well, we didn't derive it. We defined it, though. The derivative of f is 2x. And the derivative of g is the negative of the same derivative that I get for the um, sine function. So it's a negative of 1 over that radical form. <clears throat> and now according to the product rule, the derivative of f multiplied by g. So there's that piece. There's f prime. There's g, and to that I'm going to add f, which is x squared, times the derivative of g, the negative of 1 over the radical. So there's f, there's g prime. And then putting all this back together, 2x and the fraction x squared on top. So there's the derivative of that function to the chain rule. First term still involves the inverse function. That was the part where g's original function. But the second part, that inverse function is dropped away completely and the remaining form is rational. <coughs> okay, so again, same, uh, you know, the, we've introduced three new functions and their derivatives, but all those old rules still apply. Chain rule, product rule, quotient rule, whatever we need. Uh, with the new definition of how these functions behave, uh, we've got a new set of derivatives that we can take. And these become very, very important in calculus too. The properties of these inverse functions uh, turns out to solve huge problem in um, the world of calculus, but I guess you'll see that later, I hope, one day. Okay, uh, last thing I want to do is uh, the usual sorts of things. Um, number one, here's a, the typical sort of question. Um, what's the slope of the tangent line to the graph of sine inverse at the point where x is square root of 3? Actually, that's the wrong graph. That's not actually the graph, of, but close enough. We just need to, to reformat it a little bit. Uh, I think this should be, um, that should be 2, and that should be negative 2. There, now it's the right graph. Okay, so um, let's see. Where would the point square root of 3 be? Uh, I don't know, right about here. Maybe there's square root of 3. So that would be this point on the graph right here. So the tangent line, that guy there was slope. Well, let's see. What's the derivative of this function? And what rule do I need? In order to evaluate this derivative, what rule am I going to be using? Chain rule. Right? The outer function in this case is sine inverse. And the inner function in this case is x over 2. So according to the chain rule, what should this look like? Well, uh, number 1, I've got 1 over the radical form. But it's not x being squared now x minus 2 being squared, or x over 2 being squared. And then I've got the derivative of the inner function, in this case, 1 half. Uh, 
so that's what this represents. This guy here is U prime of V, and this guy here is V prime for a given function. Um, and now I'm going to do, uh, uh, to get this in simplest form, there's a little bit of work to do. In particular, right here under the radical. We never leave fractions inside radicals. Of a algebraic form is not considered simplest form if there's still a fraction left underneath the radical. So uh, I'm going to do, uh, the next step is to simplify that radical form. Um, make some more space here. No, that's the wrong place. There we go. Okay. Um, so I need to get the simplest form of this. So let me go ahead and show you how that's going to be done. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out the fractional portion of this expression. So uh, the fraction here, one-fourth, I'm going to go ahead and factor that out. So I'm going to factor out a one-fourth from uh, the uh, previous part. Uh, that's the leaving with the x squared and back, so the one fourth pulled out of x squared. Uh, what do I have left if I factor a one fourth out of one? Four. So factoring out the one fourth allows me to separate that constant from an uh, expression in the variable that doesn't involve the fraction. Then I can separate that factor from the variable portion. And in this case, that can actually be simplified. So this is a typical routine that we go through to simplify radical forms when there's a fraction included within, uh, in this case, a binomial expression. Okay, and now I can go back and finish this up. Right? Remember that I was here, and now I've shown that this denominator can be written like so. And I still have that factor of one half here that came from the derivative. And so now, in downstairs in the denominator, that two from the denominator of one half will cancel that one half from the denominator that involved the radical form. And finally, that's all we have left. So there's the derivative of uh, x over two, a sign of inverse of x over two. It turns out to be, at least in integer form, equal to this. And now, how do I find the slope of the tangent line? By evaluating this expression at the point of tangency. So, what's the slope going to end up being? One. Right, all of this here, that's just four minus three, which is equal to one. Square root of four minus three, square root of one, one over one. Um, in fact, I can make it, I didn't put it on here, I don't think. Let me see here. Um, uh, from this example here, I can see there's a general rule here at play. Uh, I guess, you know, I probably should include this because it is important. Anytime I want to take the derivative of something like this, um, sine of x over a, some number a, right, or sorry, sine inverse, it's always going to work out like this. It's always going to work out to, to this. Anytime that a is down in the denominator, uh, it's always going to work out that you know, in the standard derivative of the inverse sine function, I get a 1 here in front. But if I add some other uh, denominator here besides 1, then this term in front becomes square term for that divisor. It only works for divisors. It's the opposite for uh, multipliers. But for divisors, anytime I make that change, I can see here that it's always going to work out this way when I run it through uh, that simplified form, I always end up with that one in front being changed to the square of the given uh, denominator. 
So that's a general statement. In fact, that's usually the way it's written in most textbooks. Uh, they'll give you this format, x over a, and use this form instead of the standard form through the um, generalized expression. Okay, good. Um, and one last thing. Uh, here's an example of a function that, uh, an application, here's something, uh, a real world application, or at least a, a model, real world model that illustrates uh, inverse trigonometric functions becoming part of a model. So I've got a right triangle, it's got a vertical leg that's two centimeters in length. So let me draw a picture. Uh, here's my right triangle. This vertical leg here, two centimeters long. Um, the horizontal leg, I'm leaving undefined. So here's my right triangle, like so. Uh, I'm going to call this X. I'm going to call this opposite angle here, I'm going to call this angle theta. <coughs> so here's the setup. As x increases, if I change the, the length of the horizontal leg, the angle changes. Um, so the question is, how are they related? What's the relationship between x and theta? In other words, can you express the angle theta as a function of the length of that horizontal leg? Well, what's the relationship between these three dimensions? The angle opposite the vertical side and the vertical side and the adjacent side. How are those related to the tangent function? Tangent of theta is the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. Now, this is not a function in theta. I mean, this is not a... a, a, a and function in X because I don't have theta isolated so that's where the inverse function comes in. Theta, if, the, if tangent of theta is equal to this thing then theta is tangent inverse of the thing. So there, here's an example of the way in which the inverse function becomes part of a uh, real world model. Changing the length of the horizontal leg now can now be used to determine the actual value of the angle theta. So what I want to know now, of course, is how, how is theta changing? At what rate? At what rate is the angle changing when the horizontal leg is assigned a value of 4 centimeters? So, what do I need? Yeah, this is a rate of change. So here's our representation of the derivative as a rate of change. The instantaneous rate of change, if it was the average rate of change, I would, I would have been given two uh, values of the uh, independent variable. But this is instantaneous. The, at the instant in which the horizontal leg is four centimeters in length, at what rate is the angle changing with respect to that side? So rate of change comes from the derivative. So here we go. The derivative of theta with respect to x is the derivative of the inverse tangent function. And once again, this is a chain rule problem. Right, the outer function of composition is the inverse function. And the inner function of composition is the reciprocal form. Ah, no, I, th I guess I should give these names. Yeah, let's go ahead, let's use f and f of x is tangent inverse. Uh, what's the derivative of, tan of, of this outside function? We already established that. The reciprocal of 1 plus the square 
the inside function of composition is 2 over x. What's the derivative of 2 over x? And so, the derivative of, uh, through the chain rule, this derivative now becomes the following. It's f prime evaluated at g multiplied by g prime. f prime is 1 over 1 plus the square, and g is 2 over x. So, there's the derivative of f evaluated at g, and the extra factor minus 2 over x squared from chain rule. And now let's see if we can simplify this. Uh, 1 plus, first of all, applying the square to the fraction. So, and then the negative 2 over x squared. And now it can distribute, right? This x squared will now distribute across the denominator from the prior, and it will actually simplify the compound form. Uh, I end up with negative 2 on top. And now this becomes x squared plus 4. So when I apply the square factor term by term, x squared in front, plus 4 back. And so there it is. There's the derivative of the tangent function through the model. And the crested weight of change now at the indicated value. The negative of 2. And of course, this is negative. Uh, by the way, uh, yeah, why is it negative? Why did that derivative turn out to be negative? If I look at this model, when I'm, I'm relating the angle here, I'm relating this opposite angle to the side, horizontal side x. Why would that derivative end up being negative? What happens to the angle as x increases? It gets smaller. The longer I take that line out, the smaller that angle becomes. So that's why it's negative, because as x increases, as I increase that length along the horizontal side, that angle starts to flatten out so that it can reach the uh, target at the top of the horizontal, vertical leg uh, and complete the triangle. So that uh, is in line with what we would expect. As x increases, the angle decreases. So we would expect the derivative to be negative. And now I just do the evaluation. Uh, 4 takes the place of x. And what does this end up being? Uh, 2 over 20 or negative 1 tenth. And this is a rate of change what units are associated with this rate of change? What is the unit with respect to the angle? What's the unit with respect to the dimensions of the independent variable? In particular, in these function forms, what unit are we associating with the angle? Yeah, for that angle, what re what measure are we using? Because you know we got more than one choice. It's in radians, degrees or radians in, in algebraic format, radians exclusively. So the angle is changing with respect to radian measure. And what about the length of the side? So there, when the length of the side is 4 centimeters in length, the angle is changing at the rate of negative one-tenth of a radian per centimeter. Okay, so there we go. There's the inverse functions. Uh, two parts to this problem. Number one, this general theorem. Um, I think, I guess I'll uh, 
uh, I'm not going to make you memorize that. Uh, I'll put that on the next formula sheet for the next test and for the quiz we have on Monday. I'll summarize the formula here or this, this theorem about the relationship between the derivative of a function and its inverse. And then the three uh, trigonometric uh, derivatives, uh, these three. Again, uh, I'll summarize that on the formula sheet for um, next test and quiz. Uh, but that's what you can need in the homework. The theorem about that relationship and the three derivatives of our inverse functions. Okay, good. That's it. So, uh, again, I will see you guys again until next week. So, have a good weekend, and I'll see you then.